A lot of it is about connection to other people. That's something I really value highly um, in my personality. And Salesforce and customer relationship management is all about connection. That is Gemma Blazard, CEO and founder of The Architect Club. I'm Josh Burke, your host for the Salesforce Developer Podcast. And here on the podcast, you'll hear stories and insights from developers for developers. Today, we sit down and talk with Gemma about her long experience architecting solutions with Salesforce. We're going to go through what she called a solution jam for her Cactus Force presentation. But as usual, we start with her early years and how she got into Salesforce itself. Um, fell into it. Um, I decided to take a change, uh, make a change in my life. I moved from the UK Midlands down to London area and I took a job in sales ops and they said part of your role will be reporting, mm. making sure that our salespeople are supported in make, in forecasting their pipeline. Mm. Um, you'll be loading data into this thing called Salesforce. That will be your reporting tool. We're early adopters. Are you interested? I was like, yeah, fantastic. Thinking, yeah, it's another system that I can go and run reports from because my mm -hmm. role was a data analysis primarily. Gotcha. And I just loved the fact that you didn't have to install it on a computer. <laughs> that was my favorite thing. And the first yeah. time I even logged into Salesforce wasn't even through the front door. It was through, um, I used a tool called Demand Tools to log in oh. and manipulate data straight away through the API. Oh, interesting. Huh. Mm. So that's a very straightforward role where you're, you're a data analyst, you're working with reports. How did that, because you have a long history as a software architect on the Salesforce platform. How did you kind of go from just data analysis to the broader role of architect? I think a lot of it was about that passion for the actual work I was doing. I really mm. loved the work. I loved working with Salesforce. I loved you know, I got a real buzz out of supporting the people on the sales floor. I made friends with them. I understood their needs mm. and I could bring those needs back into shape some of the requirements that we were working on in mm -hmm. the Salesforce admin team. How did I bring some of that? I suppose that passion and hunger to learn more about the business side of sales mm -hmm. um, and service actually drove me towards wanting to help other people with it. And it's a natural urge. I think my, my father is very much the same. My, mm -hmm. my dad works in emergency services. If he sees an issue, he's straight out of the car, sleeves up, helping somebody. <laughs> it's just in, it's the way he's wired. Nice. Um, and I'm very proud of him for that. But for me, it's more of a roadie experience. I like to enable people. Hmm. And I wanted to take some of that bigger picture thinking out to other consultants, but also out to other clients. And I wanted to, I, I wanted to learn about other industries and how they work and how they use Salesforce and their challenges. So really it came from signing myself up for projects that I was nervous about in the mm. beginning, you know, making sure my managers knew that, you know, I want to work on a service cloud project so that I can do my service cloud cert. Oh, interesting. I think, you know, and at some point there was a turning point in my career when I said, I want to start working on enterprise level programs now. Uh -huh. I want to understand how those challenges can be addressed, but also how does Salesforce fit in the wider strategy? And that was, I suppose it was that interest in that that helped me to progress and take on more complex applications and projects to encourage me to deliver the value that I deliver now as an architect. Nice, nice. And today I want to talk about, you know, that com complex solution solving the jamming solutions. I'm certain I'm saying that right. But before we get into that, I want to talk about, I guess, a little bit more of that roadie aspect. Tell me a little bit more about Ladies Be Architects. What's the elevator pitch there? Ladies Be Architects is a community. It's not something you can join. It's something mm. you can participate in. And mm. it's just run by women, but it's for okay. everyone. And the reason it's called Ladies Be Architects is so that we can show other women that women can lead in this space and become delivery experts and don't have to feel shy about pushing themselves forward, pushing themselves further and raising their own profiles on projects. Gotcha. In you're the founder. So what led you to want to create such a group? Studying. Um, I really? had some bench time at work. Yeah. Um, my, my background and career has always been about delivering value to clients. So I had some downtime 
and I decided to take the opportunity to use it productively. Um, had a bit of a, a certifications uh, burst, if that makes sense. <laughs> yes. um, it was only meant to be one. It was more of a Forrest Gump situation where it was like, you know, I just kept on running. And uh, next thing you know, I'm looking at my wall. And there's 17 of them up there. <laughs> but, but I took the opportunity. And then um, that also, while I was doing that, enabled me to get involved in some pre-sales activity with work where we were. Okay. I was able to apply that knowledge because it was recently in my head. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Uh, what does it mean to be an ambassador for the group? What does it mean to be an ambassador? Um, being an ambassador is about creating environments for active learning. Mm. We have wonderful ambassadors in Australia who are currently leading a platform app builder um, study group. It's a series of hmm. sessions once a month, just for 45 minutes to an hour to go through some of the content around the app builder certification. Gotcha. And the whole purpose of it is to celebrate the achievements of women who are passing these certifications and to encourage others to structure their learning. But also we've, one of our strengths as Ladies Be Architects is our ability to take complex architectural topics and break them down into easily understandable chunks hmm. and that we think creates accessibility into that delivery leadership role and creates a career path for admins and developers do you have a favorite success story oh my gosh um <laughs> nah. i know this thinking... is this is one of those picking the favorite of your children type questions i understand oh uh, <laughs> there are so many in yeah. our community that i'm proud of but um i'm actually particularly proud of uh, my co-leader susanna and i know i'm, I'm picking my co-leader but <laughs> <laughs> I've seen her come from strength to strength. Like when I first met her, she was learning to code. Mm. Uh, she's now coaching at Rad Women Code. Mm -hmm. And she is delivering presentations about data quality and data stewardship and just seeing her progress to that level of seniority because mm. she's put that passion behind her learning. And then she has not only just collected certs, you know, like so many people do, unfortunately, she has used those certifications daily to deliver real success to her customers. And I'm just so fiercely proud of her. Nice. And I believe she's presenting at London's Calling this, this week. <laughs> Yes, she's actually just done her session. Yes. Nice. Um, nice. So, yeah, she did it all about um, data there as well. So Nice. Now, it sounds like it's a very global effort. You were just talking about Australia being involved. You're in the UK. It, it, has the pandemic really affected it much or has it always been kind of a remote exercise? Ladies Be Architects has always been remote because we mm -hmm. wanted it to include people of all time zones. Mm. That was the first thing we considered was how mm. to make this accessible. Now, obviously, when we record these and broadcast them live, there are some time zones that cannot take part. So we try our best to coordinate the timings of those that maybe one month we'll do it on an APAC friendly time zone. And then another month we will run it on an EMEA and America friendly time zone. So we do gotcha. try to do that. But we also record every session and we make them all available on YouTube so that people can study, use them to study for their exams, use them to study, not even just study, really, just to help inform their decision making while mm -hmm. they're working on projects. And how can people get involved? Come join us on the success community on Salesforce okay. Okay. Um, and we engage on Twitter. Nice. And we will obviously provide links to those in the show notes. Thank you. So on to the exercise today, where we're trying to kind of duplicate your talk from Cactus Force, a, a, a solution jam, as you called it. But first, uh, looking over your slides, I saw that you had hashtag Salesforce sustainably. What do you mean by that? As Salesforce continues to sell into more household names, the complexity of projects is going up. So hmm. There are multiple strategies that you can employ to ensure that your Salesforce org is, is working with performance, you know, mm -hmm. high speed, um, but also that your data is held in the right places to ensure mm. that you are keeping your environment as scalable as possible, especially if you've got big growth plans as a business. So Salesforce sustainably is about creating a set of, a set of frameworks that ensure your Salesforce is as optimized as it can be, hmm. because actually that ultimately has an, has an impact on the sustainability of the actual solutions that you produce. How long will this field be used for? How long will this flow stand up hmm. um, if we have 
will, will this flow work with 10 users versus will this flow work with you know 10,000 users and will it extend to communities etc do we need to redesign it mm -hmm. so we're emphasizing that thought is really important strategy is really important but not only just from a project and business sustainability, but also from an environmental perspective, because ultimately the smarter you are about tuning your your performance of Salesforce, the less impact it has on data centers, less electricity it uses, and ultimately better impact on the environment. So there are lots of ways that you can Salesforce sustainably. So let's talk a little bit about the use case we have here. Tell me about the fictional company you came up with, and I'm probably saying this incorrectly, Rapid Raspados? Ah, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just making it. Uh, I'm also trying to, well, not just making it up, but being a British person. Um, with Cactus Force, it is um, very uh, much themed around Arizona. So I decided to take nice. a look at um, some local traditions in Arizona, having never mm. been. Mm. And um, and I discovered a delicacy, or delicacy, it's a snack that they have, that, that apparently they have over there, which is uh, called, it's uh, flavoured sweet ice. So I created a fictional company called Rapid Raspados. <laughs> but I'm sure you, you actually pronounced it way better than I did. <laughs> I, I, I think I put a Spanish spin on it. I'm not really sure. Um, but I think, I think we're both pretty close. So you've never had flavored ice. I never have, other than maybe slushies that are full of E numbers. And the minute I give one to my daughter, <laughs> she's off like a rocket. <laughs> <laughs> pretty similar, pretty, pretty, pretty similar. I will, I will confess. Um, <laughs> okay. So, so our fictional company is selling flavored ice. It's, it's doing really well, but it's also bleeding money. Is that an accurate way of, of how you kind of set up their current business situation? Yes. So their challenges are that they have field sales, business development, strategic account managers, and a management team. So they have a value-based um, sales cycle, uh, mm -hmm. very much around relationships. Um, they're a B2B company. Um, they've got field sales reps that are paired with um, office-based counterparts. Mm -hmm. um, they've all got aggressive targets. So there are some questionable behaviors happening in the sales organization. <laughs> Uh, some of those examples, giving large discounts without approval, uh, bypassing due diligence checks, those naughty salespeople. <laughs> um, not to mention a version nightmare, the spreadsheets being overwritten. They've still mm -hmm. got an on-premise shared drive nicknamed the F drive, <laughs> uh, where they work on all of their forecasting and, and pipeline spreadsheets. And it's really bespoke when it comes to pricing as well. Nobody knows what version of the pricing spreadsheet has the right rules in it. Mm -hmm. So but unbelievably, they lost half a million in profit last year due to inaccurate pricing. Gotcha. Okay, so let's let's break this down. But I want to break it down kind of like you are the person in the room listening to the client give you this information sort of sort of for the first time because you do this brilliant thing in the presentation where you kind of take what they're saying and then what you're hearing into the nouns and verbs that you can turn, you know, into a solution. So let me let me just go ahead and start with the first part of the business challenge as you described it. The sales organization consists of field sales, business development, strategic account managers, and their management team. Field sales reps are paired with office-based counterparts to support a shared portfolio of customers when the field rep is field rep is out on the on the road. Sales reps have aggressive targets, so there are some questionable behavior happening in the sales organization. So what are the nouns and the verbs that you hear from that description? Well, first of all, the overall community of users, the sales mm -hmm. organization. So mm -hmm. that's my scope, mm -hmm. first of all. So that's something for me to really zoom in and focus on. There might be other things that come in on the periphery because I might then start going into management consultancy mode and saying, right, okay, mm -hmm. what are the chal challenges that your customers are reporting? What are their biggest issues, et cetera? But right now, sales organization, scope. Field sales, business development, strategic account managers, there are three different types of sales approach there. Mm -hmm. That tells me that potentially there's going to be different approaches for, for looking after that account data and looking after opportunities. Um, strategic account managers, their sales cycles are likely to be longer for example. Mm. So there might be different validation rules needed later on um, to ensure that that site, that the progression through that cycle is being appropriately tracked. Nice. And then the second part 
which I think really puts the challenge <laughs> to the mm. business challenge, giving large discounts without approval and bypassing the due diligence checks are just two examples, not to mention the version nightmare being caused by spreadsheets being overwritten rapid Raspado still uses the on-premise shared nickname, as you warned us, the, the wonderful F drive, to work on its many sales spreadsheets. Pricing is also very bespoke, and nobody knows which version of the pricing spreadsheet has the correct rules. They lost, And as you stated, they lost half a million. So what are what are the challenges and the, the problem stories that you're hearing there? Some of them are fairly glaring, but specifically. Yes. So I hear the challenges and the mm -hmm. problem statements, but I also hear about opportunities here. Okay. An opportunity to prevent financial loss that's presented through automating, automating pricing and mm -hmm. centralizing and standardizing that pricing. Mm -hmm. Now, straight away as a consultant or an admin, you might think CPQ, straight away, CPQ. Right. But actually, is it really CPQ? You've got to dig into a little bit more detail and understand exactly how very bespoke this is, because in my experience, customers always tell you that they've got something really complex. And then when you actually dive into it, sometimes it's very complex and sometimes actually it's you're not you're not so worried. The hmm. solution itself is quite straightforward, but it's the procedural and training and communication needs that need consideration more than the actual solution. Hmm. That makes sense. Tell me a little bit more about that, actually, because so is that like CPQ is sort of the 10 pound hammer, but you don't always need to bring that to bear if the pricing isn't actually as complicated as it sounds? We're all encouraged to be able to hear a problem as a consultant and mm -hmm. immediately come up with a solution. Mm -hmm. uh, that's our strength, right? And we, we think we look good by just, do, by just doing that. We look better by understanding and listening to nuance. Mm -hmm. Why do you mm -hmm. why do you think these products are so hard to understand? How many how many do you actually sell? Mm. And how many SKUs are there? How many versions of those prices? How many currencies do you work with? And once you've got that big picture, you can work downwards and start to break down some of the data and think about how best to create an easy experience for salespeople to add the prices to the opportunities, mm -hmm. but also ensure that the appropriate reporting is achieved and that mm -hmm. they can still produce quotes and send them out to customers and, and make that great experience, make it very clear to customers what they're buying. Going back to like you were first hearing in the first part of the, the business challenge, like what are the validation rules? What are what what are we going to have to automate into? So so you're not just breaking it down into a singular just throw CPQ and be done. It's it's human process, it. right, end to end, right? Like how what's the human experience between what happens before they start entering in prices to the, the fields rep actually going out and actually trying to make the sale? Yes. And it, and it's exactly, you know, that that can make the difference, a huge difference to your mm -hmm. cost of ownership for Salesforce. Because mm -hmm. if you've gone and bought CPQ because someone said, yep, you need CPQ, it will do all this <laughs> and here's all right. the magic stuff, shiny stuff that you need. Right. And actually, it might be that you need maybe most of that functionality and there are other parts that you would hand off to other solutions mm -hmm. so we're just saying think about it think yeah. about how that would work for you yeah yeah and i remember my days of being a consultant that the risk of bringing out the most powerful most costly solution like in that especially in that initial business requirements gathering it's like once you've once you've said that it's hard to put it back into pandora's box like if mm -hmm. you don't kind of offer you know the the this may be your minimal viable product solution first you you, you it's hard to get that back on the table has has that kind of been your experience too it can be because the temptation is to go for an MVP approach, minimum viable product. But mm -hmm. actually, the temptation with those approaches is that sometimes the technology team can do just that focus on the technology. Mm -hmm. And then they, mm -hmm. they come into a world of hurt when it comes to implementation because those users haven't been involved and given any feedback about their experience. Yes, They've just had this system thrust upon them mm -hmm. according to the way the process should be. And actually... Mm -hmm. We think that the process, a lot of the time, can be automated. The data validation can be automated mm -hmm. so that you get all the reporting. What There are ways that you can break these scenarios down to say, right, okay, I understand my users, my actors now. Mm -hmm. I understand what they need to do. How do I make it really hard? Well, flip it on its head. Two, two questions. How do I make it really easy for people to give disc the discounts they need to give? So that's a mm -hmm. business question. 
It could be that the discount approval levels need to change or be discussed. But also, how do I actually stop and systematically prevent large discounts going out? That's mm. easy to do in Salesforce. What's mm -hmm. harder to do is to change the mentality. Mm -hmm. I, I am being reminded of the conversation I had with Katie Coates, where I'm pitching to her, like, what's your what, what's your what, what's your starting point for doing a data analysis and, and, and how to form, you know, a data model? And her response was basically it's human centric. It's it's what are what are the humans doing day in and day out and what are the tasks that should be automated or what are the tasks that shouldn't be automated? I'm hearing a very similar user story centric approach from you. It's rare that a project hits the wall because of the tech. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Um, okay. So let's talk about the tech a little bit because I think some people listening to this might think that our friend, the F drive, might be some kind of that you're almost using hyperbole here. I can attest, and I can't name names, but I can attest that I know of at least one firm here in Chicago that uses a shared drive in Minnesota to do all of their to do their national tr like handling of contacts. So if you mm. need to do a mailing list, you have to log into a computer in Minnesota and I don't even know if it was a spreadsheet. Like I, I wouldn't even say it was a database in in Minnesota. It was like it's like I think like a word document or something like that. Like how often do you see these kind of just like old school there's a single drive there's a single database that like like companies making a lot of money are relying on not so much these days i have to admit but okay. six or seven years ago it was a lot more commonplace mm. um but with the movement to the cloud obviously a lot of companies have spent the last seven to eight years becoming more digital in their storage approach so mm. we find ourselves integrating with document repository and storage applications in, in many cases, depending on the volumes. So the fact that it's so much easier to uplift into the cloud has has got, gotten people out of this, as, as I like to call it, the asbestos wear. Yes, and I, and I think that um, actually seeing the cloud come into daily life as well, like people are using Dropbox and Google Photos to store all of their, and Facebook to store their, their precious uh, information. <laughs> right. You know? right. So people are used to the concept now that they don't have to store it on a, a local drive or anything. So that, so this is rarer, but I was, uh, yeah, a little bit of hyperbole for sure. <laughs> <laughs> dramatic effect. Dr dramatic effect, but not outside the realm of possibility by any means. Oh, no, not by any account. <laughs> we we kind of wish, we. I wish it was purely hyperbole, but I know that it's not. <laughs> um, but even more on that, and I think this is just such a, and actually I'm curious as, as to how much this, the story has changed here as well, because there's so many times I hear people get into Salesforce because their spreadsheets are being mean to them, right? Like the, the technology of spreadsheets is simply not enough. And so, so it leans them into the, the dynamic world of Salesforce. Is that still a very true transition for people that you talk to? I think, yes, at a senior level. And then sometimes on a project level, you've got someone who doesn't really want to break up with their spreadsheets. So it's I love a challenge like that because I take that as an opportunity to really show you know, what Salesforce, how Salesforce transforms that spreadsheet experience and actually mm -hmm. play to the strengths of what spreadsheets are there for. They're there for data modeling. Mm -hmm. They're there for figuring out what your forecast is going to be. You know, no, it's not Salesforce is for doing that. But <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. But um, you know, there are there's there's a time and a place for spreadsheets, and it's not for keeping mailing lists of contacts. <laughs> right, right. As an example, <laughs> or your sales data <laughs> for for or your sales in, data. In, 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 in the fictional company approach. So, so first of all, like if you're in that initial meeting and you've heard these kinds of things, what are some of the other like follow-up questions would you have for a client like this to dig into that kind of, of nuanced information to know how to start getting into the solution itself? Mm, follow-up questions. So looking at this, um, obviously, we know they've got the opportunity to prevent financial losses, but mm -hmm. where I can see risks straight away is that because the pricing is so bespoke, it's like Chinese whispers on how much it costs to sell these Raspados. And, and roll that back for me a little bit. What, what exactly do you mean by bespoke? So according to the scenario, 
Mm-hmm. Um, they, they've got so many different, but they've had, they started off with one pricing spreadsheet, which has all of the different rules. So if a customer mm-hmm. buys in bulk, the price goes down per unit. And then, and then of course goes down based on volumes. It's volume based pricing. So, but because, you know, very, the leadership team have been putting those prices together, but haven't mm-hmm. necessarily centralized them. That has led to those figures being much lower than the leadership team expected. So mm. hence the reason, hence the feeling that they've lost 500 grand mm. due to that inaccurate pricing because everyone was using the old spreadsheet. So that tells me there's a people change in governance risk. Mm-hmm. It also tells me there's a data migration risk. And also it tells me that we need to actually take part in a master data management project too. And in fact, we may have to do that before we even start doing Salesforce. Mm. Because we need a single list mm-hmm. of customers to, and, and perhaps orders and products as well. Like people forget that MDM isn't just about customer data. There's, there needs to be a master, a master for products too, especially when you've mm-hmm. got multiple systems involved. So there's a data migration risk. There is um, a strategy consideration. Mm-hmm. There's a roadmap consideration there. And then you've got the actual activities and tasks involved in collecting, gathering, uh, adding, applying unique identifiers, and then identifying the ways and, stra- and, and the way that you're going to orchestrate that data migration and any future integrations as well. Nice, nice. And when it comes to the like the chaos of the sales team itself, like what's what's the tech that you're going to do in, to get, to put in to like enforce that governance? Certainly. So because we know we've got field sales, business development, strategic account managers and their management team, that tells me the actors. It also tells me the roles, if you like. Um, it is a competitive sales organization. What mm-hmm. this briefing doesn't tell me is whether they want to continue to be a competitive sales organization or whether they want to promote co- collaborative account management approach. Mm. So that would be one of the first questions. You know, is that broken for you? Is that even an issue? Right. Because, you know, it may be that they come out with sharing and visibility requirements. We don't want users to be able to change each other's opportunities because it could get quite nasty out there. Right. And like, actually, like, tell me a little bit more about that because if I feel like everybody I've talked to back in my old days of consulting, like competitive sales teams, and let's define competitive sales team. Competitive sales team is simply team A, team B, you you two are in competition and I'm going to reward whichever one makes the most sales, period, right? Like kind of classic Shark Tank room kind of scenario. Is, is mm-hmm. that about right? Mm-hmm. So what's some of the advantages of moving to a more collaborative sales team? Diversity of of thought and opinion. Okay. Um, the more the more heads that you have sharing experience and sharing opinion, you know, obviously not too much sometimes, but because <laughs> you could spend hours on it or days on it. Yeah. But identifying and spotting the right people to um, help you on a personal level, but also to help you with the deal itself. Mm-hmm brings the benefits of that experience, brings the benefits of being flexible to a customer's needs, adjusting your deal so that it works best for the customer. So those are the sorts of things I would encourage. And then the way the tech would back that up is around enable is actually through accounts um, teams. Mm -hmm. You Mm -hmm. can add, you can add the field rep own the um, account with the office based counterpart on their default account team so that they always have that recognition that they work together on those accounts, that those accounts are part of that portfolio. Which I think is kind of a fascinating, not from a data modeling point of view, but like the admin role of visibility versus transparency, because I kind of remember the first time somebody gave me the the, the talking points of, no, you, you know, only these people can see these opportunities because these other people might try to poach that opportunity if they're allowed to see it within Salesforce, which, which tells you how naive I am <laughs> from a salesperson <laughs> point of view that I had to learn that that was actually a thing. It is a thing, yeah. And uh, I mean, my personality type, I'm a bit of a campaigner. So I'm the one that's going, okay, well, those are behaviors that actually are much bigger than Salesforce. You can, Mm -hmm. you need to think about strategically what kind of culture you want to promote because those form guiding principles for how you then go about designing Salesforce, right? That's your values part of the V2 mom. And is there any other tech that we're missing here that could be helping out our our friends, Rapid Raspidus? 
Absolutely. The due diligence checks that are being bypassed. So if they're selling huge volumes of units to a company and they don't know if that company um, can pay for the order. Oh, and they've had issues with bypassing due diligence checks. Um, mm-hmm. So there's an opportunity to actually integrate here mm-hmm. with public-facing systems, credit credit checking systems, chamber of commerce style checks to ensure that the business actually exists and ha- isn't insolvent, etc. So those opportunities take that whole responsibility away from the salesperson. Hmm. Nice, nice, nice. They don't have to worry about that because it's done, but they right. equally need to be notified if it comes back with a problem So that, and, and given a strategy to resolve that problem. So, okay, so solution jammed, but we're kind of bantering about this. It's a fictional company. With all of your experience, do you have like for the for the architect who's actually in the room? And I think I've heard it a little bit throughout throughout our talk about you know n- listening to the nuance and looking the world. Do you have just kind of words of advice for when I'm sitting next to the uh, across the table from the client? How should I be approaching them? Open ended questions. Okay. Um, for a start, um, they are a, an important tool in your arsenal. Being willing to stand up and draw concepts out. Mm-hmm. Being bold enough to challenge conversations and say, "Okay, we're going, we're getting going down an interesting path here, and we've got different views. Let's do an exercise and try and understand what the themes are, so that we can agree a way forward." So a lot of that is about being brave and bold enough to pick those up and actually test what they do for you. Those um, gotcha. little games in in workshops and surveys you can do, and even ride-alongs. Nice, nice, excellent. Yeah, I have to say my my experience as a um, a suicide hotline <laughs> volunteer mm-hmm. helped an awful lot in my role as being a consultant in business situations. Oh my goodness, I would imagine <laughs> it puts uh, my my skin has grown much thicker over the years. I would oh, say, yeah. um, you know, there there are still behaviours that I come across any in any line of business that mm-hmm. are unfavourable mm-hmm. and. You know, I'm always learning on how to deal with those better. <laughs> <laughs> and that's our show. Now, before we go, I did ask after Gemma's favorite non-technical hobby. And I have to say, standing here in Chicago, where I am still not eligible for a vaccination, uh, there are still definitely some of these hobbies that I am distinctly jealous of. This would be one. My favorite non-technical hobby. Uh... Do you know, I still don't know. At the moment, <laughs> it is currently relaxed. Actually, yes, I do know. Um, going to spa days. Um, there's a group of us in the UK that get together when we can. Uh, at oh, the moment, it's brilliant. been once a year. Yeah, yeah. and we have... Sp- uh, its unofficial name is Spa Force. <laughs> <laughs> And we book ourselves into a local spa. We spend the whole day there, have treatments and just hang out. That is my favorite thing to do. I want to thank Gemma for the great conversation and information. And as always, I want to thank you for listening. Now, if you want to learn more about this podcast, head on over to developer.salesforce.com slash podcast, where you can hear old episodes, see the show notes, and have links to your favorite podcast service. Thanks again, everybody. And I'll talk to you next week.